Ad break time. The Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations. They have some great stuff going on, including a new upcoming course for their certificate in applied game design. Travis Hill will be teaching Finding Your Niche, expanding your skill set across five different gaming genres starting May 16th, so make sure to sign up. They'll also be partnering with Ion Game Design to publish a curriculum guide for the upcoming Cartini from Darkness to Light, which you're about to hear about in this very episode. Additionally, you should support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash beyondsolitaire. I want to make more board game videos, and if you want to see them, I need more free time, which means I am trying to grow that Patreon large enough to quit summer school and devote my entire break to board games. For now, though, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here on the pod with two very special guests this week. Uh, I'm here with Sharia Iwandini. She is the designer of Cartini from Darkness to Light. And I'm also here with Dr. Christian Hins, who is going to do the curriculum guide for this game. So I'm really excited to have both of you on. Um, Sharia, uh, I first interviewed you as a Zenobia finalist, but why don't you just tell us the basics of your game, you know, how it's gone, and, uh, and where it's at now. Yes, so my game is called, like you said, Cartini from Darkness to Light. And first it was a submission to the Zenobia Award. And now it has been picked up by Ion Game Design. And hopefully it's going to be published very soon. We're going to go to Kickstarter. The plan is maybe around May. Um, So the game itself is about, it's the the era is around the late 1800 and early 1900 in Indonesia. Um, And the theme is around women's education. So the idea is that I really want to highlight through the game how educating women really lift up entire nations. Um, So um, I designed the game. Hopefully the mechanism also kind of makes you feel like you are educating women, you are educating girls. And then because you're educating them, graduating them into different professions, you open up the games. There are more things that you can do so that you accomplish more things in the game. So um, in a more technical term, it's an engine building game. So you build your engine to be able to do more things. Uh, But I also really want that feel to come across, which is feeling like, oh, you know, we are inviting um, girls from different islands of Indonesia. They go to school, they learn, they become a professions. And because of these professions, they lift the entire country as a whole. Oh, that's fantastic. And um, it was originally just called From Darkness to Light, but we've added on Cartini. So uh, why don't you tell us why that is? Just because she seems like such a foundational inspiration for the game. Yes, so uh, Kartini is one of the more famous uh, women's heroes from Indonesia, and she is uh, definitely one of the biggest inspirations that I have for this game. So Kartini from Darkness to Light, the From Darkness to Light, the original name of the game before we add Kartini, is actually um, uh, an English translation of the title of um, a book that is published um, based on the collections of Kartini's letters. So Kartini used to write letters in Dutch. So she has a correspondence with her uh, friends in the Netherlands. um, And in those letters, she writes about her dreams for the women of Indonesia. And um, it was quite funny because after she passed rather young, um, and she, uh, so her friends in the Netherlands decided to publish the letters. And there was a little bit of kind of like, a little bit of controversies because um, some of the publishers in the Netherlands did not believe that she wrote those letters because they said, oh, it sounds too intelligent. It sounds uh, too high level Dutch for someone who is a young woman in Indonesia in order to be able to write this. So there's there's also that entire uh, backstory of, of she's not being believed that she can be intelligent enough to, to write these letters. So these letters then being published and her ideas when she was still alive, she established um, schools for girls because she really believes that um, t- teaching girls are really the step towards Indonesia's freedom, which was at that time still under the colonialism of, of the Dutch colonialism. Um, so her uh, ideas were carried forward afterwards for um, a more kind of like widespread national level uh, teaching of Indonesian girls. Um, And then she now is recognized as one of our biggest uh, heroes in Indonesia. 
Um, and uh, she's always celebrated every 21st of April. It's a Kartini day where we celebrate um, girls and, and, and women um, and our participations in Indonesian society. Uh, so it, it's just apt to actually put her name at the front of From Darkness to Light uh, because even the entire mechanism of the game is pretty much her idea. Oh, that's awesome. And then, uh, Christian, you are going to be helping this game find, hopefully, right, a, an audience in, in an educational setting. So how did you get involved with the project? And um, what are some of your plans as a curriculum guide begins to, you know, to be born? Well, as um, I'm a, a game designer for education purposes, um, so I teach history and use and design games and use games in strategic history at the university level. And um, I became familiar with this, this body of work through Zenobia as well. Um, and so by various means, um, I was introduced and encouraged to look at this game and think about it and how can we make use of this for a, a classroom um, for a classroom purpose. And uh, I was very excited to think that I could maybe de deliver some curriculum that would make this a game that's not just fun, but educational. Um, so yeah. the game is a really beautiful um, demonstration of some concepts uh, that come from Benedict Anderson, who writes, a scholar who writes about um, what enables nationalism um, and nationalistic movements to begin. And he posits that the creation of um, a common or shared um, narrative, common and shared culture, common and shared language, um, common and shared body of readings, um, written the writ written texts, that these can create a common identity across um, a group of people who are extremely different, who have different language, who may have different um, ethnic identities, um, who may be uh, separated from each other by a good distance. Um, and that reading, the written word, is this critical element of that. So here we have education introducing um, a body of literature that's being produ produced by a national publisher um, to create, in a sense, a shared, a shared history, a sense of a shared history that may not have existed before, a sense of a shared identity that had been divided into many small, I mean, there's a lot of islands involved and not everyone in, 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 in Indonesia speaks the same language or, or, or you know, has exactly the same culture. So education for women becomes this critical piece of creating a shared mythology. And I mean mythology in a respectful way, not as like, as a lie or fiction, right? This is like a shared, a shared story about where we come from, what we know, what does it mean to be a citizen? How do we effectuate citizenship? And how do we, a we, resist a them who's imposing on us with the colonial and imperial um, you know, external forces? So um, I'll be um, carving out readings from Benedict Anderson's, the first two chapters of his, of his book are very accessible at the university level. And um, it, it will help, I mean, it's an academic work, but it will help university level students uh, achieve uh, uh, a skill of reading that's much better than what you would get from textbooks. I will be using some selections from the, uh, some reading selections from the original primary documents that are, you know, the game is shaped around. Um, and then putting in, in the game or, or fitting into the game um, reflection points where students can um, begin to identify, oh, this is what this is what Benedict Anderson is talking about, or here's an example of how Benedict Anderson's theory is actually made manifest in actual historical perspective. So these are my ideas um, for making this uh, a game that would work very well in classrooms, both about you know Indonesian history, but about um, I teach courses on women and nationalism, um, and you know uh, about nationalism. In, writ broadly. So any of those kind of subject matters, this game is going to speak beautifully to. Oh, man. Now I want to go back to class. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about, okay, this game is an engine builder and it's about education. But what are, I guess, some of the specific historical moments or concepts that it is built to kind of bring to light for people who are, are playing this game and may not know a lot about the subject matter. Can we get some some good juicy examples? 
Yeah, I try to put in um, as many references as I can into the game, of course, with some creative license, because the game actually spans quite um, a long period of time. I think one thing that we can look into history is that history is not always linear. So it's not always in a very quick succession. You got like, because you feel like in a board game, like, oh, you educate women and then the, you know, the, the entire nation is lift up. It's not, that's not the case. There's a lot of kind of like twists and turns, of course. So it's a, it's kind of like a streamlining of that period of history but I also take some creative license into taking some elements outside of that strictly period of time also to highlight more of the um, participation of women towards um, liberating Indonesia as a whole um, so what I did is that I make sure that the 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 game includes also different women heroes from Indonesia um, in many different professions. They can be fighters, they can be politicians, they can be patrons, um, and to highlight that and make them actual characters in the game that you can that you can play. Um, and also my, many other different elements. Uh, for example, because Indonesia is Christina Christian already mentioned that it's about it's a it's a very diverse country. So I want to make sure that diversity is also celebrated in the game. Um, so make putting in a mechanics where a mechanism where you need to have diversity in order to score more points. For example, you need to connect different islands in order to uh, to gain more points. So these kind of little elements that I like to put in into the game. Um, of course, there's also other historical flares like different events that happens along the way. Um, also so different quotes from Cartini's books, uh, Cartini's letters to be included in the game. So these are the different things that are um, uh, being included at the moment. And my hope is that uh, that we are able to put in as much flair as possible because i understand i think liz you, you understand this when you when you when you design a card you don't want that card to be too busy because then there are too many information on a card but at the same time so you also want to be sure that the card highlights elements that are important and to me the story is important it's not just the mechanism of the game i want to put the flair of the story also into the game so that when People are picking up a card. They're like, "Oh, it's about Chut Nyat Din, a different hero from Indonesia." Here's a little bit of her story. I can read it while I'm holding the card, rather than if it says Chut Nyat Din. If you want to know about her story, go to the rule book, for example. That's another step, right? But if it's easily available for people to read, that's what I want. So I want that. I, I not necessarily that the game is meant to educate per se, but because you play the game you are you're encountering something different you're encountering something new so it's part and parcel of the entire experience i think that's always the best way for people to kind of just like um maybe open up to something that they they, they haven't seen before so that's the intention hopefully that that is uh, um, that we are executing it well by the end of the day <laughs> i think so. Christian. no i think that it's executed beautifully I love the idea that the information is in the card, not that you have to go look at an index somewhere. I think that's really wonderful. Fantastic. And then, so Christian, you offered a lot of different possible um, courses where this game could be useful. Uh, clearly this is also meant to be um, a hobby game that people have a good time with. So uh, how do you balance between making something educational and making something just a good time. I think that, you know, as historical gamers and as teachers, um, you know, that's that's always a, it's a tough line to walk, but it's also so crucial. Well, I think that it helps if the game was conceived of as a hobby game first, <laughs> right? And then my job is to not interrupt that. My job is not to interrupt that. My job is to choose some pedagogy that, um, opens up moments in the game for insight. So if you want to use it in that way for insight, then I'm making supplementary materials that can be folded into the game or utilized after the game or begun at the beginning of the game um, that kind of preface, might preface or you know add a layers of, of um, critical thinking through the game. Okay, and if the game is solid as a hobby, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a playful experience, then it will work in a classroom playfully. Um, my games that I design I suffer the opposite. Like I have like a, an education plan in mind, things I want people to know. And then the question is, uh, how do I make it fun? 
<laughs> so I think that this is actually a really good way to make a game that um, is both educational and fun. That's that's the easiest way to do it. Awesome. And Sharia, what about your intentions kind of going in? I mean, I know you did this for Zenobia, but, you yeah. know, um, you know, we talked a bit about it, but how yeah. are you imagining this game would be played? I think it's so cool. There's going to be a curriculum guide for it. Yeah, no, I completely agree that the fun element needs to be there. And I think throughout the development with Iron uh, Game Design, that's always been the one of the part that I emphasize, I, I, whenever we have a meeting, whenever we had like a, a play test development, I always said, but did, did you still make sure that ask people whether they they have fun playing the game? Because it's always very important to me. So I completely agree with this. It's, not, it's something that you don't want to take out from the game. Um, so that has always been my intention because I love playing games myself and I want to play games that are fun. So I want to be sure that that is the element of the game. Uh, but my original intention was, it was definitely, Zenobia was definitely a significant reason why I make this game. Um, it's not like, because for the longest of time, I always think designing a game is something very complicated. Because there are a lot of things that needs to hang together, that needs to really work well with one another. It seems like designing, I don't know, like a Formula One car or a rocket, you know, like it's, it's, it's there's so much elements to it. And I think... I don't have the brain for it. That that's that's what I convinced myself before that I don't have the Ooh. brain for it. Um, but when Zenobia comes around, there's another really passion of mine, I guess. Um, when I was playing games, and I think maybe we all noticed it, is that board uh, the modern board game design tend to lean towards a certain style of design, which is a lot of it, unfortunately, replicating mechanism that is very familiar to colonialism. So you go to a place, you kind of conquer the place, you um, extract a lot of resources, resources from the place, and then exactly, and then you. So a lot of these kind of like a replication of it. So um, and there has been quite a lot of discussion about why we're keep reproducing these ideas. Can we not do something different? Are there any other themes that can highlight things that are different? So I've always been intrigued by that. And this is something that I'm passionate about as well in my um, other life, in my professional life as well. So when Zenobia came around and um, the, the call is to highlight different historical backgrounds, I felt like I cannot let it go. So um, I lean towards what I feel like I might be better at, which is um, storytelling, um, which is, uh, uh, I like games that are more Euro leaning, for example. So I lean towards those that I'm more familiar with in order to create a game. And the first thing that I that comes to mind was Kartini, the story of Kartini in Indonesia. And to be fair, I don't see that many school based game, like a, building a school, which I think is actually lead, like actually lend itself quite um, readily to a board game mechanism. But for some reason, we don't have that many uh, let's you know let's let's teach people in a form of a board game so I thought oh you know it might be something interesting to 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 look into and then just you know take one step um, at a time then becomes the game um, how it is at the moment so yeah so it's, it's very much uh, an opportunity but also kind of like an intention of I, I, I really want to do something because if not, I'm going to regret it. If I if there's this opportunity coming around, something that I've been thinking about and I don't give it a go, I'm going to regret it. And then I lean towards something that I'm familiar with and just kind of like take one step at a time into this. So I'm super happy and even amazed myself what the game looks like now because it feels like there's magic happens along the way that I don't know where it came from and it becomes this. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. So how has the game evolved since Zenobia? Oh, it has evolved a lot. And um, I don't know how it is because I always thought board game design is there's one designer who's super intelligent and genius and they came up with an idea and it becomes a board game. Apparently that's not how board game is made <laughs> because um, the, the developers in Iron Game Design has been absolutely crucial and parts and parcels of the way that the game it is now. I felt like the idea was mine. All of the really significant, important elements there is still there, but they really helped develop all the little parts that, that make a game a game. So even decisions like if we take turns, do we want to take turns between players? Do we want to take turns all together at the same time? That's a development decision. And as a designer, I don't have 
um, the bandwidth in order to decide that. They're the ones who are doing it because they keep doing so many play testing and they say, ah, this makes better sense than that. Mm -hmm. And also the developing uh, the developers, um, both uh, Robin and uh, Peter in um, Iron Game Design, has many different ideas that they test out as well while being um, while being respectful and truthful to my own design. So, so far the development process has been really fantastic uh, because I've, in the beginning I said, I really wanna be sure that the soul of the game is still there. So when they're developing it, if I feel it strays a little bit from what the soul of the game is, then I would uh, I would communicate it with them and they're super open to that. And they're like, okay, let's let's turn back, you know, let's go back to what how it was before. So yeah, it's been, it's been a, a, a giant learning experience for me as well. Awesome. And then, Christian, have you gotten to see uh, this game in newer incarnations? Or, I have um... not. Ooh. I have not. So, well, I mean, um, I have uh, a print and play from an early, an early version of um, the game, uh, and so I look forward to seeing a more, a more recent one. But it's certainly uh, sufficient for me to understand. Okay, this is what the game is doing. This is this is what the mechanic is trying to do. Um, this is the information that's being imparted. Um, this is what the students, the, the players, the students are experiencing. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing a newer, a newer version. Yeah, and the other elements that I'm, I'm very glad that I and the game design is taking this approach is that the, um, the illustrations of the game, because I think it's as important as the game itself, especially if that game is highlighting a particular cultural background, a particular historical setting, for example. So we make sure that a lot of elements of the game, the, the choice of the illustrations, the choice of icons, for example, even the choices of language, the choice of words that we use are highlighting Indonesian history. Um, the tricky part here is that because it's in it's an historical setting, there's a lot of Dutch colonial construct to what the situation is. Mm -hmm. So um, again, like I said, it's um, in a way, it's a creative license from my part, deciding that as much as I can, I'll take the Indonesian construct of what the situation is, the choices of words, choices of names of um, places, for example, instead of the Dutch name, uh, right. we're taking the Indonesian name, for example. And then I'm also being quite careful in terms of the illustration itself, like the as simple as, for example, the attire that um, the characters in the game are wearing to the different iconography um, to make sure that it really highlights Indonesia overall. Of course, I'm not an all knowing everything about Indonesia. So there are things that uh, will probably, you know, in nuances might not be very Indonesian or, or something like that. But I put a lot of effort into that because I think not just the mechanism of the game, not just the story of the game, but all the different elements of the game, as much as we can, we make it to highlight and to celebrate um, the culture that we're celebrating, uh, which is Indonesia and the young women during that time. Awesome. Um, so this actually leads me to a question. I, I thought it was really, really interesting. You bring up the point of kind of resisting uh, Dutch colonial concepts that have kind of permeated discussion of this subject um were there any times where you kind of caught yourself buying into a narrative that then you later rejected um or had to uncover through more extensive research um you know things that had been kind of more buried well i've been very careful to um look into resources that are more from the indonesian perspective um so thankfully it's less contentious that way but definitely one of the ways are um things like the the naming convention right because the even names in places in indonesia it has a dutch counterpart which then uh, uh reverted to indonesian when we had our independence so i guess if you really staying true to history then you will use those uh, dutch names and to be very honest i think this is a decision making i'm not going to look down on people who said we're going to use the dutch name because it's more historically accurate i think there is an argument to it Yes, but mm -hmm. I make a decision that I'm going to use a more modern name because I want to highlight the Indonesian part of it more. So it's about, I think, like, I think we all know that history is about choices. Uh, there are people who write history and those people make choices on how they write uh, history. So since now I am in a way in an author um, a seat, then I make my choices. This is the way that I tell um, history through board games in a sense. So of course it's not... Um, 
there are other people who will tell it differently and I, I won't shut them down. It's a, it's, 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 it's the different voice. It's a different retelling of what happened during that time. And it, and, and my way of telling stories is not, it's not about saying like, this is, this is the truth. This is the way that the story needs to be sold. No, it's another voice because I think the way that we can understand something, a time, a story is about getting many different versions of those mm -hmm. stories. Um, I grew up in Indonesia, but I was um, my my postdoc was in the U.S. part of it, and then I, I moved to the Netherlands, the other part of it. So the first thing that I realized when I came to the U.S. was that I was I finally got access to resources, books that are looking at Indonesia's history, but not from Indonesian perspective. Mm. And the story is very different. Right. And it really opened my eyes because I'm like, oh, so far I'm, I've only been able to see it from one perspective. I'm not saying which one is right or wrong, but it's about having this rich understanding of what's going on at that time. I think it's more important than just um, saying like, this is the right way of looking at it. But as an author, in a sense, as an author, as a designer, um, I choose one voice, um, mm -hmm. which contributes to all of the other voices that are out there. And the voice that I choose is to highlight the Indonesian aspect and elements of it. I really, I really um, like that and um, support what you're saying. It's kind of um, one of Zenobia's um, missions just articulated in a really beautiful way. Um, it would be very easy to make this a story about the end of Dutch imperialism, as if the story were about the Dutch. So yep. you can center somebody else, yes. right? Make space for somebody else to talk about them creating their own independence, right? Indonesians creating their own Indonesian identity. Um, yes. Indonesian, it's about Indonesians. It's not about the, the Dutch, right? Yeah. So um, yep. that that is something that I think um, really appealed to us in Zenobia about your application that uh, that potential was there. And to see it so fully realized in this game is really like, it makes my heart, it makes my heart feel good. So thank oh. you for your hard work. Thank you for your hard work. It's exactly what I was hoping would happen. Um, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a, a person of color in the gaming space, um, you know, uh, I'm sensitive to the fact that um, people of color and women are, talked about there you know the game isn't it, 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 it the game isn't about them they're just like an ancillary or like they're like a, a figurine or they're like an extra card with a an exotic face or something like that but it's not about them um and so i feel like it's it's radical it's it's part of like you're doing part of the work um that you know your forebears were doing and I just think it's wonderful no, I, I agree so much on that one, Christian, because the other part that we made a conscious decision for this game is that I mentioned this in the very, very beginning <clears throat> to Iron Games Design, is that I want to be sure that all the characters in the game are all women. It's not that we're not acknowledging um, the, the contribution of men and um, other people as well uh, in Indonesia's history. Of course, of course, that's the case, right? And in the stories, in the flair that we highlight, of course, there's uh, contributions of everyone included there as well. But in terms of the characters, the illustrations, I wanted it to be all women. It's not the reason why I wanted to do that is because I just want to see a game where we feel very comfortable <laughs> to just see everything are just well, the faces of women. Um, and I don't think they're not there. There are too many games that are there like they're out there. Um, we're still a little bit more comfortable to see um, games or any other kind of work of art where the faces are all men, for example, um, mm -hmm. just because it's something that we are more used to see for the longest of time. But when it's all women, it still feels there's something wrong because it feels like, are you shutting out a particular group of people? But that's not that's not the idea. The idea is to celebrate um, a particular group for example in this game it just happens to be women it can be a different group in a different game and not to feel that you are shutting down others if you are celebrating that particular group right we can like i said my my um, intention is to add into the diversity into the richness of it not to shut out not to say like this is the best way of doing it but to not feel um, uncomfortable or to not feel afraid of, of celebrating a particular group in a particular way. I think it's a good exercise. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Liz. We're, we're, we're having our own No, I'm actually here for it. Keep going. But, um, <laughs> yes. I think that um, 
women and people of color are expected to uh, empathize and to have some sort of willingness to enter into the world through the eyes of men or through the eyes of the West. Um, and it's beautiful that we can ask men to empathize, right? They can, they can do that too, right? They can enter yeah. into, into, you know, a different space and try to experience the world through the eyes of women or through the eyes of people of color or people who are not from the West. Um, and I think that's, I think that's good brain exercise. I think it's really good. And if you don't mind, Liz, just to kind of follow up on that, I completely agree, Christian, because I, one of the one of the kind of like challenge that we discuss even in Zenobia as well. I think maybe Liz, you also uh, uh, was um, you're aware of this conversation. Was that there's often this idea of if it is made by a particular group or an, um, a more minority uh, background um, designer, there's always a question of is this game made only for a particular group. If this game is about women, is it only women who's going to play it? If this is game about Indonesia, is it only going to be Indonesian people who's interested right. in that game? Right. And I think that's a very interesting question because I think part of the reasons why we have that construct in our head is because for the longest of time, if this has always been the case. Mm -hmm. But I think if we have more games that are um, not necessarily kind of like including some mainstream elements or it's specific about a particular group, and we're just so used to other people also playing it and feel they can connect to a game that might not always have their own representation in the game and they feel they can have fun with the game. We are more open to the possibilities of like, oh, now I'm playing a game coming from the uh, Pacific Island culture, for example, or I'm playing a game from a, 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 a part of history that is not part of my own history. Then I feel, then we feel more comfortable to feel like this game is also for me. But in order to do that, I feel we need to have more of those games out there. So mm -hmm. people feel like, no, only only a game that is like this that I want to play or or, or of interest uh, to us. Um, so it is a risk, I feel, because uh, maybe it will shut off some people who feel like, well, I don't see myself in this. It's This is not a game for me. But I feel like it's a stepping stone towards people being more comfortable in looking at different games and go, yeah, I'll give it a go. I can relate to this, even though I'm not exactly the characters that are portrayed in the game. That's my hope. And because it's a game, that actually lowers barriers to yeah. empathizing with um, the other people who are not like you, people who don't speak yeah. or believe like you, um, where, you know, there's some social cost, right? In a game, yeah. there's no punishment. There's no punishment. So it's okay to play and pretend. And then once you get fluent at that, then it becomes easier to look around the world. Right. Yeah. The game has this very powerful potential um, to be revolutionary. I mean, in its own in its own way. So I think, um, well, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> so, Christian, I have a question for you that's related to this. So, uh, I feel like you have a delicate job as the curriculum guide person because you need to support Sharia's statements as the historian and author of the game and mm -hmm. also kind of bring in sources. So for example, um, you know, how will you uh, express um, what's going on with the, the authorial choices that Sharia is making? For example, like when you choose to name things in a curriculum guide where a professor might want the Dutch names, but Sharia has made her choices as somebody making a statement about history from her perspective. Oh, that's a wonderful question. And I had not wrestled with it until, until now. I can only, I, I really feel strongly that I can only obey the game designer. Um, I, I, you know, um, I don't know Indonesia well enough to go around and swap all of the place names. Like this is not, this is not my work, right? I would, I would use the Dutch names if, um, if that had been provided to me. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it seems counterintuitive for me to go and undo what, what she's done. That's counterintuitive. Um, and I think there's no reason why uh, students uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a class in the United States can't learn foreign words or foreign place names. Like this is, you know, um, if we can swap pronouns, uh, you can learn to do this. You know, if, if we can control our language uh, to be respectful to other people, then they can learn to do this. Um, if my students can learn um, the names for Indian you know, emperors and empires 
and these are foreign names, then they can learn to do this. So um, I know that in my own teaching about Asia, um, I don't use anglicized versions of names for, for that. And we don't talk about Confucius, right? I mean, that that that's like, a, that's a colonization that uh, as an Asianist, I don't use. So it, it didn't strike me that I would do anything other than preserve the language that's in the game. Um, I don't know. I don't know the history well enough to even fool with that, you know. Like, but see, I also find this so interesting because this, I think, is like the flip side of what a lot of us go through reading history that's been heavily colonialized, where we don't know the other names and we don't know any different. And I think it's so cool that this game is going to offer perspective from, you know, a formerly sort of like you know, maybe more marginalized in the historical literature, I'm assuming, um, uh, perspective. And I, I just really like that, you know, the history that you are taught is the history that you know. And so who is teaching you that history and who has control of that narrative changes the facts that are available and changes the names that are available. And I really like kind of seeing this game come on that scene and make some statements especially for us here in the united states i think um you know we we maybe don't have that full global perspective and so this will be the perspective we get well even this conversation gives me the idea that i can teach to this matter so likely in a historical context if we're teaching about colonialism in, in asia and southeast asia um you know you're going to have words like batavia and jakarta and you're going to yeah. have these old these old names well, what if we have um, exercises that, you know, match locations and then change the names? I mean, that, that's very easy kind of exercise to put in so that students can, get, can then refer to these locations during the game by their location names and not by this. I mean, that's like decolonizing, not just teaching something new, but un, undoing, you know, something um, that that is like effortless kind of um, step in in terms of curriculum building effortless that won't take any work at all so i actually have another question that kind of speaks to this which is okay so sure you grew up in indonesia you've spent time yeah. in the netherlands and this is a game that just because of nobia rules right is written in english and it was judged by primarily american people and christian and i are engaging with your game as as americans so have you seen your game played by people in different areas so like have you managed to play test your game with people in indonesia or who are experts on indonesian education have you gotten to test it with people who received like a dutch historical education and then i know that a bunch of americans have played it so are you seeing kind of differences in response to your game or have you not gotten to see that yet been able to play test it that extensively um, I followed the Zenobia schedule at that time, so that's the step kind of like into creating the game. Uh, but ever since it was being picked up by On Game Design, it was uh, play tested a little bit more um, rigorously, I guess, like and more often. Um, but because Iron Game Design is in Sweden, so I think a lot of Swedish people are playing the game. And so far, they've been able to relate to the game. They really enjoy the game in a fun way. So I think that's take the first win to it. Uh, in terms of uh, Indonesian people themselves, just my circle so far that uh, that I've been playing it with, and of course I've been discussing also with um, my uh, people that I know about the idea of the game. Um, a lot of Indonesians at the moment, at least that I know of, um, board gaming is something that is um, also kind of like increasing in terms of the interest in Indonesia, but often we're still doing board games that are maybe more uh, casual, more gateway, something that you can play with a lot of people, you know, it, it's still, th that's the kind of interest. Well, From Darkness to Light, uh, Cartini From Darkness to Light is a little bit more um, strategic game, so it's a little bit more Euro, for example, that might be slightly a bit higher complicated uh, in, in terms of the complexity um, compared to maybe a lot of people, a lot of gamers in Indonesia are familiar with. But that's also part of the things that I do want to uh, introduce uh, to Indonesia. Indonesians actually have a lot of um, game publishers. Um, but they do make these conscious choices. So I've had conversations with them before when I when I met them in conventions and so on. And they said, yes, these are all the games that we have, which is highlighting a lot of Indonesian culture, which I absolutely love. And they said, 
we make it into a party game, for example. We make it into a word game. Um, the reason is because these are the kind of games that are very accessible for a lot of people, which I think is really great. So that choice, um, introducing word game that way, is, um, is, is fantastic and it's reaching a lot of people. So now I want to start introducing something maybe of a higher complexity, hopefully with the theme that Indonesian people can relate to. Uh, so I am um, hoping with the Kickstarter that we are going to uh, to do with the Iron Game Design that it would reach out more to the Indonesian community themselves. Um, and to be fair, I think at that time I will receive a lot more feedback from them. And I am, um, of course, preparing myself because people would have different perspective. And like I said, I don't see myself as the all and be all representations of Indonesia. I am not um, Indonesia historian myself. Of course, I have some knowledge about it. I have some exposures just by being who I am and also a little bit through my work and through my, my professional work. Uh, but there, might, there are a lot of things that I don't know. So I am looking forward to getting those inputs as well and adjusting the game uh, based on that inputs. I think, like I said before, it's always good to hear many different voices. If by the end of the, the, uh, the day I go, Ah, but I'm still going to make a decision to go this way, then that will be a more informed decision of what other people has been giving inputs to. So yeah, so it's a step-by-step -step in terms of, of building this game and including the voices for Indonesian people themselves. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that, to that step of the game as well. Awesome. And then just out of curiosity, does the history that you're presenting in this game represent any history that you were taught in school at any point in your career? Or is this something that you had to do research to find? Uh, well, no, um, it's definitely taught in schools and it is something that um, a lot of uh, Indonesian grew up with. Um, so the story of Kartini is something that we are celebrating, of course. Um, we have, a, like I mentioned, the national holiday for Kartini. So it's something that we are familiar with. And a lot of the heroes that I um, highlighted in the games are heroes that we are familiar with as well. But then I get to also do research in terms of highlighting what are the heroes that are out there that I also want to input into the game? So it's it's been both. And when I'm doing that research, it's lovely because you come across stories of women who are just absolutely remarkable and you're just completely in awe of what they've done. Um, and I love including that into the game. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it has been both. And I think I also mentioned this before that um, I love uh, picture books, children's picture books. And when I had my niece um, six years ago, I wanted to give her a collection of pictures books about women. Because there are these picture books now that talk about the uh, women figures in histories, right? And what I found is that these picture books, as much as they're absolutely wonderful, how, how cute, colorful, I love everything about it. But they tend to highlight um, women who are heroes or figures from um, particular geographical area in the world. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find a single Indonesian woman um, being highlighted in any of these picture books. So mm -hmm. I see the game to also my way of contributing to that because I feel there are so many women around the world in history or, or at the moment currently hasn't been highlighted because we are not part of the more um, known geography in the world. So I want this to be to be that as well. So so yes, Liz, this is something that through schools um, I've learned, but also open up through research, finding out what are stories about women out there that I also want to include in the game. I love it. And then Christian, just one more for you before we kind of get into some fun stuff. Um, what? So this is a game. How many players is this game designed for, Sharia? Uh, up to six. Up to six. Okay. So, yes. you know, Christian, you're a pro at this. Um, you know, this sounds like a game that would be fantastic on just a game night. Um, but then also, you know, it's also clearly not just an intro-level game. Um, you know, how, how can this translate into a classroom setting um, in a way that is going to be accessible for students and if you know what advice would you give to teachers and professors who want to use something like this in their classroom i really recommend um that uh we create a a video playbook right where um how to set up the board is something that students can look at um and it could be even in small in small pieces so that you know here's board setup here's an example of this piece. Here's an example of this mechanic. 
Um, and then, you know, something that students can then look at um, on their own outside of class and get some sense about, and then they can also go over it in class. And so it would take, I think, an entire period to teach people how to play the game along with homework about how to play the game, and then you could play the game. Um, my experience deploying complex games, most, most of my games are, are serious, um, is that you need to take the time to teach it or uh, the, the difficulty of, of learning it um, gets in the way of them thinking about the material. Um, also, you know, it's not as if you can't play it twice um, or, you know, play it through three rounds, then play the whole thing, right? So that you can take part of a period to do it um, and then take an entire, entire period to actually do it. So that would be what I would recommend to um, instructors who are thinking about using it. Um, and it would be possible to actually create, you know, the, the videos as part of the package that goes with the curriculum. So um, that would be my strongest recommendation. Um, a playbook, students won't read it. <laughs> don't ask me how I know. <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. ask me either. <laughs> yeah, they don't learn. They don't, they don't, students don't learn by reading anymore the way a different generation did. So if they are used to learning by looking at YouTube videos, then why fight it? Why fight it? Let's just use that tool to get them up to speed to then be able to think about the material. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then, so I'm just looking forward to playing this in whatever way or the other. Uh, I'm normally a solo gamer, but I'm just going to make people play this with me. <laughs> there will be a solo mode, Liz. Yes. All right, even oh, better. Yes. That brings me so much joy. Yes. <laughs> so I'll, I'll play a solo and make other people play with me. Um, but uh, just some fun questions. So Shreya, you mentioned there are lots of really cool stories of female heroes of Indonesia that came up. Do you have a favorite to kind of leave us with that's just extra fun? Yeah, I mean, um, I mentioned it one before, Chut Nyadin. So she's um, a hero from Aceh. So that is the northern Sumatra part of Indonesia. And she is just a wonderful, um, just a wonderful fighters. Um, she carries the entire um, uh, Achenese troops basically against the Dutch colonialism. Um, she's taken over from um, her husband and the other uh, uh, men compatriots in leading troops. Um, and the Aceh people also have this entire army that is consisting of um, women whose husband has fallen in, uh, in the fights. Um, so they, are, they have like their own uh, shouts when they are uh, when they are fighting, so I just like thinking about it. Kind of like uh, I, I just feel like um, <laughs> uh, I feel I feel really inspired and motivated by it. Um, so Chut Nyadin is also another. So that's 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 one name, and uh, she's also very well known in Indonesia uh, about her story. Um, and the other person that maybe less um, celebrated in Indonesia, but I came across her story is uh, Kumala Hayati. So she's a naval officer. So she leads a battalion of ships um, in, in, in the fight against the Dutch colonials. And uh, she wears uh, some sort of a hijab. So I always imagine like with her hijab, like flying in the wind uh, in the ship. It's just, just a wonderful, beautiful image in my head. So these are the women that I, when I read their stories, I'm like, wow, you know, the, the kind of bravery um, that they have is just always, um, I'm always in awe in reading their stories. I am so excited to hear more of these. Uh, but for now, uh, for both of you, what are y'all playing for fun right now? Ooh. I just moved into Singapore. And the great thing is that um, found a group of people, like-minded people who likes playing games. So we're now actually playing RPGs. I don't play a lot of uh, role-playing games before. Um, it's not always my cup of tea, uh, but this group of friends that I found recently really like playing RPG. So I decided to give it a go because I think it's always great to kind of like open up your horizon, try different games. Uh, so we're playing RPGs and uh, we just played um, Ayla and the Shiny Things or something like that. It's a very cute RPGs. Um, I really like it. And we're hoping to play tomorrow um, Aeon Trespass Odyssey, which is a very, 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 very high complexity rating. It's 4.7, I think, in Board Game Geek. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am both in trepidation and also <laughs> excitement to try to try that. Yeah. So I, as of now, it's actually RPGs, um, particularly because the game group that I found here like playing that. So I, I, I'm excited trying something new. 
I love it. Hey, Christiane, I know you've been busy, but anything? <laughs> well, with my very small gaming group, um, I am working with Quiet Year, um, mostly because I want to design games that are in that storytelling mode, um, that are like group narrative construction. I want to use that in my classroom. So I've been doing a, a kind of a deep dive, a deep study of this that that kind of mechanic, that kind of structure. So we've been playing The Quiet Year, which I really, I think it's such a wealth and it's affordable. <laughs> I like games that are deep and affordable. So that's what I'm working on right now. That is extremely reasonable. Um, and then if people are going to find you online to ask questions or see what you're up to, uh, where can you be found? Well, uh, my, um, Twitter handle is at Expelicious. That's X P E L I C I O U S, and you can find me there. Excellent. So you know, you know, I'm I'm terrible at this, Liz, because I think you know, last time you also asked me, and I don't I don't have social media, which I think why I keep my sanity. <laughs> to be fair, <laughs> um, uh, so I think reach out to Iron Games would be great, um, and but they have convinced me that maybe for this period of time when we are launching the Kickstarter, that it'd be good for me to have a Twitter, for example. So I'm working on that, uh, having a Twitter for, for the sake of the game. I'll let you know when it's, when it's, when it's there. <laughs> all right. Excellent. Once it's there, you can, uh, we can all be friends on Twitter and we can just drag you down into the muck with us. <laughs> <laughs> Introduce me to the Twitter sphere. Yes. <laughs> But uh, but seriously, both of you, thank you so much for taking the time. And it's been just such a delight to talk to y'all about this game. I'm I'm really excited about it. So thank you I. so much, Liz. And thank you for your questions, because I think, you know, like when we talk about games, we think about questions such as, you know, how fun it is, what is the mechanism and so on. More about kind of just playing. But I think games also sometimes we can talk about something more serious, important, whatever you want to call it. And so thank you so much for asking all of these questions as part of the game, it's part of the DNA of the game. The game is still fun, but also has other things that we'd love to celebrate and highlight. So really appreciate you asking all of these questions. It's a beautiful game. Thank you for your hard work. I'm pumped about this. So for those of you who are out there, um, if you don't know already, you can find me anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. I am perpetually online. So please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming. <laughs> <laughs>